Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really, really excited to be here. It's morning for you, but it's uh, getting it's evening here time. It's uh, around 5 p.m. here. Um, so like Jackie said, I graduated in 2006 from USAO. And I'm the one with the short cur curly black hair. This is a picture of me <laughs> when I was a student at USAO in the theater. And I think it was during a Beatles revival show or something. And I went with um, two of my friends and I'm actually still in touch with them. Um, it's interesting how I actually ended up at USAO. I was a junior, uh, I went to a junior college first and I didn't know what I was gonna major in. Um, and I applied at different majors at different schools. And I was in Durant checking out their university and I saw that they offered a uh, jewelry design class and I was like you know what this is what I want to do I'm going to study art the next school I go to I'm going to apply for an art degree and the next school is USAO and thankfully I got accepted and I uh, attended there um, art was not something that I was amazing at I'm not the best painter I'm not the best um, drawer, um, sculptor, anything like that. But I really, really enjoyed the creativity process. And I'm sure Jackie can tell you I was not the best student. Um, but um, I was really lucky to be surrounded by people who were creative and I got to appreciate what they were doing and I learned a lot from them. And the th three things actually that I still take with me from what I learned when I was at USAO. One of them was, I don't know if you still have it, but the creativity class, do you guys still take that? So that was like a one hour credit class. And um, I remember, okay, well, that's still, that's still like, I still take what I learned from that class with me. And, um, and I remember we were in one of your classes and you had us all in a circle and you had a pencil and you asked us this pencil, what are different uses for it other than a pencil writing, right? And that thought process, you really made us think of different solutions. And I think that's helped me um, in my job to think of different ways to find different uh, um, solutions to a problem or different ways of um, thinking about exhibitions and all that. Another thing that I will still, I still remember and brag about, like I was a really, I went to a really cool school was um, in art history. So for me, art history was like a foreign language. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I, um, we did not learn art history in school, Renaissance period, cubism, modernism, all of that was like a foreign language to me. Um, and so I kind of struggled, but I think what helped me was the final, uh, Jackie gave us the opportunity of, asking us like three questions and we just had to answer one of the questions and we could answer it in any way we wanted. And that honestly um, was the coolest thing for me because I came from an, a school where things were very structured and now everything is different. And that makes you, it makes your, it changes the way you think. And that has helped me, um, I think throughout my career as well. Um, and so after USAO, I went back to Saudi Arabia, not knowing what I was going to do. Even when I was studying art, my family were like, well, what are you going to do that in Saudi Arabia? I was like, I don't know. I just want to study it. So I ended up um, working at a university in records and information management. Um, it was not creative whatsoever. I hated my job. And so I was like looking for other jobs elsewhere. I ended up working um, in branding in another company. And at the same time, we had the opportunity, um, our, our, our former king, King Abdullah, opened up a scholarship program for people who wanted to study abroad. And so I applied to go and do my master's and I ended up at Oklahoma State University. And I decided to go with international studies because I wanted to combine something that related to me. So I'm half American, half Saudi. Uh, I really like both cultures and I appreciate all sorts of cultures. And so I thought, what could I do that would combine that? And, and so I studied that. And this picture that you see here is with me. Um, I'm, I'm the one pointing. And it, we, while I was a student, we were um, very active. I, uh, I, we established the Saudi Student Association. We did lots of different programs at the university, um, introducing Saudi culture to the community. This picture is an image of um, something the Saudi Student Association did. It was um, for the International Day. We, there were countries represented from all over the world. We represented um, Saudi Arabia. We had a little like presentation, then we had an art activity, and it was just a really fun way to share our culture. Um, with the students. 
So I graduated and when I graduated from Oklahoma State, I went back to Saudi Arabia and there were two places that I wanted to work at. And nothing had, to, none of those two jobs had anything to do with art. Um, one place was Saudi Aramco and it's an oil company and I thought I'd work in their public relations. The other one was King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Um, it was a new university that was built and it was also managed by Saudi Aramco. So I applied to both. I got a call from the university and they um, said that we're gonna schedule with you another uh, interview. So I'm like, okay, great. And uh, my father had taken the, they, they called again and my father had taken the call and he's like, tomorrow you have an interview with and King Abdul Aziz um, um, Center. And I had, I had no idea what I was being interviewed for. It was completely different than what I thought I was being interviewed for. I Googled it up really quick. There wasn't a lot of information about it. So I'm like, okay, world culture. What can I say that I've done that involves world culture? worked with exhibition designers, fabricators, curators, register, everything. So I had to learn basically, we were a small team and we worked with a lot of contractors. And so I had to learn everything about everything. And then this is where um, I ended up working um, the last 10 years of my career at ITRA is the nickname of the King Abdelaziz Center for World Culture. I don't know if you all know uh, this building. Um, it was de designed by um, um, a Norwegian company. And in 2018, it was voted one, one of the 100 places, uh, must see places. Um, this building, people like the design, some people don't like it. Um, I have really great memories there. I was a curator for around six to seven years, and then I ran the museum for three years. The museum has three, uh, four galleries, contemporary art, Saudi culture and heritage, Islamic art, um, natural history of the Arabian Peninsula. We also have a energy exhibit, um, the Great Hall where we brought in exhibitions from around the world, as well as the first children's museum. So I was really fortunate to be able to work on all these different projects um, from the beginning um, and to its establishment and, and then running it afterwards. Um, the, this building is not just a museum, it has a theater, a cinema, a library, and it's, and it's part of Saudi Aramco's way of giving back to the community. But there's also been a few challenges because this energy exhibit belongs to an oil company, they're very business oriented. So um, they're all about, you know, making money, but they also do a lot for the community and this was one of the projects. But we faced a few challenges. Um, one of them were, was, when we started out, they were saying that we were not going to be a collecting institution, that we were going to get loans from other entities and bring them to Saudi Arabia. And as a team, we thought that wasn't the best thing because, of, um, well, it costs more to get loans from outside. If we built a collection, we would have something to stand on. We would have something to lend to other institutions. In a time of crisis, we would have something to showcase to the public. Like, like last year during COVID when there was lockdown, if we did not have a collection, we would have nothing to show. Um, so we were able to convince management to let us collect. So then we were faced with another challenge. The way things are done in an oil company is that let's say you want to buy a pipe and you go to multiple vendors and you get the lowest price. But for a cultural institution, you can't do that. 
And so how do you convince them, a company that has been around for around 83 years, how do you convince them to change that, right? And so you can't, you can't go out to multiple vendors for one piece of artwork. You're going to go to a gallery. You're going to go to the artist. You're going to, you know, to, to get it. So we have to develop a mechanism and we had to um, get buy-in from all of management. And I'm really happy that we've been able to collect. So I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, some of the exhibitions that we've done. And if you have any questions about any of the artists or artworks that you see, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Um, what also one of the products that I also got to work on a few months after I started was um, Saudi Arabia's first participation in the Venice Biennale. This was in 2011. This artwork that you see in front of you is by two artists, uh, Shadia and Raja Alam. They are sisters, twin sisters. One is a um, award-winning writer and the other one is an artist and they work together to develop this work. It's called The Black Arch. I have another picture of it here without visitors. Um, I'll, I'll, I can tell you a little bit more about it or you can ask me or you can look it up afterwards. And then here was uh, the, one of the first exhibitions that I curated and it was titled Wasl Ma Wara Al Qalam or Wasl Beyond the Pin. And we worked with the British Museum to develop this exhibition. It's a exhibition on Arabic calligraphy or on calligraphy. And there are many, many exhibitions around the world about calligraphy. And one of the challenges was, uh, was how are we going to make our exhibition different or unique? And what's interesting about the Arabic alphabet is that the, the letters change based on where they are in a word. So it's, and, and the words connect. So kind of like when you write in English, uh, it's cursive. It's like that in, uh, in, with Arabic all the time. But also what's really unique about the Arabic al alphabet are that other languages um, adapted and adopted the Arabic alphabet. So you have Urdu and you have um, Persian script as well. So we thought, let's go with that angle. And wasl um, is an Arabic word that means link. So it's a link between the letters because they all connect, but also the link between um, the Arabic and other cultures because you, you have the other ones that have adopted it. And then here's just a little overview of what we had a few commissions. We had uh, most of all the artworks on display um, we had acquired, we had around 40, uh, 52 um, objects and it was divided, the exhibition was divided into three sections. So you had divine revelation. So in, um, in uh, Arabic was used a lot uh, with uh, and it, for religious purposes and making it really look beautiful, um, things that you would find in the Quran. We also looked at it from a science and poetic perspective, how they used um, Arabic, and then we looked at it in an urban uh, way as well. The next exhibition that we worked on, and this was when I started um, uh, being the head of museum, so my colleagues worked on this exhibition, it's titled Zamakan. And zamakan is an Arabic word where they combine two Arabic words, zaman, which means time, and makan, which means place. And so this was, we, the, all the artworks in this exhibition were commissioned works, um, and they were Saudi and Saudi-based artworks, uh, uh, artists, sorry. Um, and we gave them, we wanted to get from the artist, what is the perspective, what is time and space to you? And every artist had a different way of how they saw time and space. And then I'll just show you a, a picture here. This big circle is an artwork by Zahra Al-Ghamdi. She's a female artist. Um, and this work, um, you can't, I don't know if you can see the details, but it's, uh, it, they're, they're not twigs, but they're, it's a plant based in Saudi Arabia. You can find it in the desert. And when she was talking about collecting these uh, plants, um, it's very thorny. And um, she, poor thing, she got a lot of cuts from working on from working on this project. But this plant is known to be known for being very resilient. And um, although it's uh, it's resilient and it can hurt you, but it also offers protection and shade to small animals. So she was talking about how time and place is representing, like she was talking about how Saudi Arabia, this plant represents the country in terms of it being resilient, but also offering protection and, and things like that. Um, and I don't know if you see the artwork in the back, it's uh, their oil cans. And it's done by another Saudi artist. Her name is Maha Malouh. And she calls it, uh, this artwork is called Oil Candies. And um, 
she she thinks of these oil cans as candy wrappers because I don't know if, if you know Saudi Arabia really flourished because of the discovery of oil. And um, she sees she sees these cans as as representation of you know when you open the the oil being the candy something sweet something that people love and the wrapper something you throw away and that's that's um, what she thought about behind this work. This next exhibition is a image is an image based exhibition, and it's titled Maraina. Maraina is an Arabic word meaning uh, meaning our mirrors, and the way the team designed it was also when you walked in you saw. You, uh, a reflection of yourself because it was a mirror of uh, it was a mirror of, of the people of society of our culture and so we wanted people to feel associated with the different a connection with what they're seeing and this uh, exhibition featured uh, photographs and videos and we actually I don't know if you know uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto He's an Italian artist, and he's never done any work um, using um, subject subjects from the Middle East. He had exhibited in Lebanon, but never his work has never uh, showcased anyone from the Middle East. So we approached him um, for a commission, and we asked him if he would, you know, um, work with us, um, and uh, and and he agreed. And it was really an exciting, exciting time. Um, this work, uh, if you were standing in front of it, it's mirrored. So when you stand in front of it, you see yourself. And so he always, his work always looks into reflecting society and what was ha what's happening. And now everyone's like obsessed with using their phones. And um, even when you're together, you're not really together. And so when you are standing in front of it, you're part of that scene. Um, and this is really um, a, a work that people love. Um, and then another work here is Sultan bin Fahad. He is a Saudi artist. Am I over time? Uh, okay, sorry. Um, he's a Saudi artist, and his name is Sultan bin Fahad. He's a he does different types of work. This image that you're seeing is actually uh, taken uh, is of King Abdul Aziz. So he is the founder of Saudi Arabia. So it was taken many many years ago. Um, and um, the artist manipulated the image. The actual image um, here, what you see, it looks like King Abdul Aziz is driving the car, but he flipped it. And in reality, he was a passenger. And if you look at the images, uh, reflections on the car, it's of the four, first uh, oil wells of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. And so he just represents uh, what's happening in, in the country. And then I also wanted just to share with you a, a my one of the last projects while I was at Ithra and it's a um, Islamic arts exhibition. This uh, this exhibition is titled Shatr al Masjid or the Art of Orientation, and it looks at um, the curators of this exhibition were looking at mosques and not in terms of a place of worship, but rather of its function as a community center. It was used as a school. It was used as a hospital sometimes, a soup kitchen. Um, and then so the exhibition itself is divided um, to three sections, function, evolution, and aesthetics. And this exhibition, we um, had a loan agreement with the Ministry of Antiquities of Egypt to loan around 84 objects from their collection from the Islamic Arts Museum. It took us around two years to get that loan agreement signed, but it was worth it. And they have one of the best Islamic arts collections in the world. And some of the pieces on display, we actually took it from their museum that were on display. We're like, we want this one, this one, this one. Um, so we're really lucky and blessed that we were able to do that. And this video is just gonna show you, it's um, in Arabic mostly. So if you have any questions about it, and there's some parts in English, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the translation of it, but I just wanted to give you a visual of the actual exhibition and the people that worked on it. So this is Mona Jahami, she's an assistant curator. Transfer the art foods often the installation or installed art foods, depending on the needs of um, if the exhibitions we have uh, periodically. Document all the art foods. This is Constantino, he was our conservator. Secure database of all the information about the art foods. Here uh, in Gallery Three right now, uh, we've just finished installing the second exhibition, uh, 
um, titled um, Shatra Masjid. Uh, this uh, exhibition addresses the mosque, uh, the evolution, the functions, and the status of the mosque. كل الخزانات اللي حوالينا الان مصنوعه خصيصا لحفظ هذه القطع الاثريه والمحافظه عليها من ناحيه الضوء، من ناحيه الرطوبه، مستوى الرطوبه، ومن ناحيه ايضا نظام التكييف هنا يحافظ على درجه معينه متناسبه تساعدنا ان نحافظ على هذه القطع الاثريه وما نعرضها لاي خطر. In the gallery today is we have uh, the exhibition combines three collections, it is own collection of uh, 34 pieces. Uh, we also have 84 uh, objects, masterworks from uh, the uh, Museum of Islamic Arts in Cairo. We also have uh, several pieces from the National Museum in Riyadh. All the pieces have a story and a history. We always have a dream that we can see the design that will enter and try to take a few of the information, but we also give a few of the information that will allow the information to the information. فهي مجرد انك انت تعطي مساحه للزوار انهم ينسجون قصصهم ويتذكرون تاريخهم وتجمعهم بهذه الاشياء هذا شرف. اوكي. Okay. So that was the last project I worked on. And then in October, I um, got the opportunity to apply for the position of the general director of the National Museum. And I resigned from Aramco and IFRA in December. So I'm very, very, very new to this museum. I started uh, in January. And this is the National Museum. It was opened in 1999. It's been around for 22 years, around that. Um, and what's interesting about this museum is it used to belong, it used to be under the Ministry of Education, and then it went to under the Ministry of Tourism, and now it's under the Ministry of Culture. Um, and it, it has an amazing, amazing, amazing collection. But since the opening of the museum, it has not been renovated. The exhibitions have been the same. And so what we're working on right now is uh, developing the identity of the National Museum. I don't know if, if you ever have a chance to look at the website. I hope you don't because it's very brown and I, I want to change that. Um, and so we're working on developing a, a new strategy and a master plan. There are going to be huge innovations to this uh, National Museum. We want to keep the integrity of the building. We want to um, work on um, is, um, showcasing the objects in a better way. Currently, the National Mu uh, Museum has eight galleries. It starts with a man in the universe, and then a prehistoric, and then it talks about the Arabian kingdoms, and then pre-Islamic period, Islamic period. It goes on to, um, so Saudi Arabia um, has three states. So it has the first Saudi state. Um, it was uh, established and then the Ottomans uh, took over and then it went again and tried the second Saudi state and then again the Ottomans and then finally the third Saudi state is what we're currently in right now. Um, so I don't have a lot to share about the National Museum yet, but um, there will be a lot of changes right now. We're in the planning phase, working with different entities to really come up with the best way moving forward and really making it more of a community um, place for the community to come. Because a lot of times, especially in Saudi Arabia, a museum, even though this museum has been around for 22 years, it's not a museum going culture. And so it's really about making, getting the community involved and making this their second home. Um, so that's what we're working on. And I think I'm just about over my time. So I will uh, stop now. But if you have any questions, I am more than happy to share them with you, uh, answer them. And thank you so much for your time. You bet. Thank you, Layla. That was wonderful. Yes. Uh, for those who have questions, just type those in the chat and we will get to those once we get to the Q&A session. But yes, thank you, Layla. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, I'm going to introduce our, our next speaker now. So I've got to uh, change this. And Aaron, you are welcome to uh, unmute if you'd like. And Hello. I'll a quick uh, introduction here. So this is Aaron Lynn. Aaron Lynn uh, has been working in facade restoration in New York City for the last 20 years. Uh, grew up in Grady County. So uh, welcome, welcome back home, even if it's by, by Zoom, like <laughs> virtual meeting. Um, 
You received your Bachelor of Fine Arts from USAO in 98 uh, with a concentration in sculpture, but I know you were more of a mixed media type of artist. You used uh, any kind of materials you could find and, and yep. did pretty nicely with them as well. Uh, you started working in precast concrete shop shortly after moving to New York City. Uh, you now manage the daily operation of a shop in Long Island City, uh, working with architects, engineers, contractors, uh, building owners to provide safe buildings, uh, dealing with their ornamental details, uh, the outsides of the buildings or the facades. So uh, thank you, Aaron, and I'm going to turn this over to you. You're welcome to uh, open up your or share your PowerPoint. Um. Can you see it? Yes, I sure can. Okay, let me move that over here. Um, yeah, that was a really good uh, talk uh, from uh, that we just heard. I um, that was the <laughs> whole world I've I've never really knew much about, and the buildings were uh, pretty exciting. Um, so some people that may have heard uh heard from me or what you know i assume i don't know any of the students there they may have heard about hay hinge and so i thought let's well, see let me go into presentation mode um oh this is okay they so i thought you know what let me google um hay hinge and see what i come up with and wow <laughs> uh i when i made hay hinge there wasn't Google, um, or at least it wasn't in the state that it is now. Um, and it seems like lots of people have been have uh, done Hay Hinge. Um, so I didn't find that, but I did find, uh, this is a photo that was on the internet uh, back in 1997. Uh, some of you may know Jim Dudding on the left. Uh, that's me in the center uh, a long time ago. And uh, that's Drake Matney. Uh, on the right. Uh, and then I'm going to quickly go through, I guess I graduated um, from USAO, then I, this is going to quickly show a few slides of artwork that I made in New York. This is the first piece I made in New York. Um, it was like television static. Um, it, um, it was a motorized contraption that uh, played uh, in front of a piece of glass. Um, silk screen TV static that moved. Um, it actually gave a really good optical illusion. It was kind of loud. Uh, the handle uh, moved with it too, but it functionally as a machine, it wasn't too great. Um, then I kind of spent an entire year making machines. This is an arm wrestling machine. Um, it would move back and forth almost like an arcade or a toy, um, kind of really small, probably 18 by 18 inches, uh, maybe a foot tall. Um, I'm going to go past these pretty quick. This is football machine. Um, this is uh, just also it uh, wood and ceramic and metal um, and a motor vibrator. Um, so this piece shook. Um, the, that's not styrofoam, that, uh, which actually really one of my favorite parts of this piece uh, is the wood uh, carved to look like styrofoam. This is Styro Mountain. This is uh, made out of porcelain. It's another view. This was a small part of a, of a larger piece, dinosaur fight, um, where that was cut off. And then, then I started working in concrete because at this point I'd got a job uh, working in concrete, um, which I'll kind of go into later. This is a flag. I'm just, these are all, all like copy paste images. Um, and kind of the most ridiculous thing that you could possibly make out of uh, concrete. Um, these are not painted. This is all uh, precast into molds. Uh, this is Jefferson, which it's actually the profile of Washington from a quarter, but with a kind of an elaborate profile running around and, and a fantasy scape. Uh, here's the book um, with like a beach scene and copy pasted images, almost like emoticon or uh, emojis, but emojis didn't exist at that time, I don't think. Here's a, a different casting from a mold, uh, dirty casting. Um, this, is a, this is a full size profile uh, where I was kind of learning to run uh, plaster moldings, uh, cut knives. So I 
cut a profile of my face uh, and I cast it into the colors. Uh, at the time I had uh, white glasses and this is what my profile would look like ran. Um, here's a piece, concrete base, uh, solder top, uh, pirate chest. Um, there's rhinestones here. Um, this is a concrete piece. Uh, this piece is, uh, I'm casting highway safety beads so it's reflective. And what would be the most ridiculous uh, thing you could cast concrete, uh, you know, make a, like a cloud. Um, and then the fact that it bounced light back, it's really hard to photograph. Um, here it's trying to see where, you know, I was having problems getting my flash my camera but um if you if you flash it if you experience this the the light shoots back and kind of flattens the shape um here's then i started i was drawing a lot with illustrator um and this is drawings of tires i'll just quickly go through these drawings there are drawings of cars um but kind of like focusing on some details uh, letting other details. Um, this was like 2002, 9 11 was uh, on everybody's mind. Um, and then here, this is 2005. Um, th this is a piece that I'm, I'm using a router bit to draw, and I'm cutting the, the, the white surface off of Formica, and the Formica is mounted to plywood. This piece assembles kind of like a jigsaw puzzle a way to allow me to make large uh, drawings um, that would assemble kind of quickly. You know, I, I'm kind of can be a messy person. And like if I had a large piece of paper, you know, the corners and then it would be wrinkled. But with the Formica, you know, it would always look fresh. Um, this is clothes pile. The same same idea. This is a smaller piece, um, kind of like uh the, like a like a mushroom cloud but but just using the shape of popcorn um this has a rhinestones in it this is a stolen car um this is the largest one i made um and it really really is bulky these pieces all fold down into like a less than two by three feet uh box um but this this is a full-size car essentially I was also very, I photographed this like two weeks ago and it was very difficult to even find a place uh, big enough. Uh, this is the, the white space you're looking at is uh, eight feet by 12 feet. Um, and it's still barely fit. And I had to turn it sideways. That's for perspective uh, to me for scale. Here's a smaller free, uh, freehand drawing. Uh, I just folded a noose and laid it down and drew it. Uh, also on Formica, cut out the negative space. Um, here's a more recent piece. Uh, this is uh, uh, number two recycled plastic. Uh, these are 18 by 18 inches. Uh, it's also uh, like symmetrical, bisymmetrical, the symmetry in the center. So they hung together. Um, this is uh, uh, another concrete piece. It's flat in shape, um, but I'm spraying different pieces into a mold. Um, when I did these, I did these in pairs. Um, some of these castings didn't work at all, but I'm mixing lots of different uh, concrete mixes um, and then just spraying them into a box. Um, this is the side. I wanted to leave the side rough. Here's the two. Uh, one of those was in a show that was a couple of years ago at an alumni show at USAO. Um, and then I'll quickly go through unfinished works. Um, these are cinder blocks uh, and I have like crates of them. Uh, I want to build a, the, the kind of the same concept as Hayhenge, uh, but build a pyramid with these blocks. Um, these blocks are about one inch by two inches, one by one by two inches. Um, this is something else that that uh, I find really exciting. This is a black concrete. And if you looked at this without a flash, without a camera flash, it would just look like black concrete. Um, when you take flash photography, that depending on the surface of the shape, it, it will reflect light back at you. Um, this is uh, also, this is an unfinished piece, but it kind of falls along this same theme of a landmark 
that's uh, using kind of a material shift. This is a tire arch. Like the concept, this was a mock maquette, I guess, that, and I still need to put the tire tread on this piece. Um, it, now it's like, this was like from 10 years ago. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, but this, this piece, you, I could actually envision uh, truly building one. It'd be tire, tire tractors at the bottom and you could tip them in a little, put some shims and uh, have a rebar found, concrete foundation. And just as you go up and lay more tires, you could fill that with concrete and rebar. And at, maybe at the top would be like a go-kart tire. Um, and you could make an arch out of tires, rebar and concrete. Um, Oh, quick sponsor break. I think this video should last. Eagle Burger was a collaborative effort that we were always involved or lots of different. Um, now I don't know how to. And since my Eagle Burger sponsorship uh, was not that profitable, I had to get a day job in New York. Um, and in 1999, you got jobs through the newspaper. Um, and in New York, that paper was the Village Voice. And I saw an ad for color matching uh, at a concrete shop. And I thought, well, I could do that. Um, so I went and, uh, and I've been in the same company still. Um, this is our concrete library. Um, when I started, there were we were on color sample 1900 and now we're at like 10,300. So <laughs> there's a lot and we throw away every year we throw away samples. We're in the process of throwing samples away right now. This is uh, kind of an, an example of the different kind, the textures and colors that are, um, uh, that we produce at our shop. Uh, this is a photo, this is our shop, the front door. Uh, we're next to the 59th Street Bridge. You can see the UN, uh, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building. Uh, and the background is, uh, is an electrical, uh, like a large salt pile. Um, and a lot of, uh, and if you, uh, the bridge is crossing the East River. So we're in Queens and on the other side is Manhattan. Um, this is a sample of like how we would set up a color match. So we're matching an old weathered piece of concrete um, here, this is our mold shop. We're making, uh, we're setting up pieces, different pieces come in broken, we'll fix them with plaster. Some molds are made directly uh, with uh, carpentry. Uh, we use rubber, um, plaster um, to, to make whatever mold. Uh, sometimes I think of uh, mold making as similar to um, Similar to mining, you know, coal mining, they always say, you know, you want to, the, the best mine is the cheapest mine, you know, you, you don't want to put all this infrastructure in. So a lot of these molds is like trying to figure out how much it's going to be used. And so you can make the most efficient, uh, fast mold um, because we will run through and make, we probably make 20, maybe 30 molds a week in our, in our shop. Um, we have, I'm trying to think we have five people that are uh, mold makers and we can add on a couple extra that are working in different parts of our shop. This is a black and white photo of our mold shop. Um, it's constantly rearranging mess. Um, this is casting and what happened or, you know, right now we're coming into spring. And so we, a lot of people have set up these jobs and we've cast and we don't want the concrete to be exposed to freezing weather so that it'll have white salts. Um, so we've been storing um, truckloads of, of finished precast pieces in our shop. Um, some of them ornamental, some just plain windowsills and coping, um, getting ready uh, for the spring. Um, and this last year um, has been quite unusual. These are, um, plaster ornaments that I've collected along the way. Um, you know, like the sun is from the Ritz Carlton, uh, the Garland, different things from Soho, Midtown. Um, this, is, uh, this is our shop. Uh, this was taken maybe four years ago. This was a sculpture we made for Terrence, Maine, um, which is in 
a, a hotel in San Francisco. I think it's it's in the building that's leaning that everybody talks about. Um, so hopefully maybe it'll counterbalance the building. Um, this is, that's Terrence. When you walk into the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art and you go to the, um, on the ground floor, you go to the American craft collection. Uh, there's a lot of ceramics. Um, they usually have a chair that he made. He makes bronze chairs, makes bronze doors that are in, um, that are in, been in several movies. Um, when they want to make, make a movie look like a very rich person's house, they'll throw one of his doors in the background and he's got a table that's in um, different Louis Vuitton uh, boutiques around the world uh, that's been recent for him. Uh, here, this is from uh, USAO visited the shop maybe three, four, five years ago. Uh, time flies, there's a pallet of balusters and uh, one of somebody from USAO. Um, this is a recent, I want, wanted to like take a job and kind of just walk through it. This is a photo I got um, in March of this month. Um, they just installed these pieces. They installed them through the winter. Um, this is Learner Hall, part of, uh, part of Columbia. Uh, it has its own Wikipedia page. A lot of people describe it as the donut building. Um, it's Columbia is of, of the campus has these beautiful bow art buildings with uh, copper cornices and limestone and uh, you know just these kind of over exaggerated classical details and uh, the architect who built uh, I think he's Swiss but he was the head of architecture at Columbia he wanted Columbia to have a modernist piece. Um, I don't know, so it's mixed mixed reviews, but we did the uh, bullnose detail because I'll show you. The original was these glass blocks that they made, um, which the only thing that kept water out was sealant. And New York has a lot of freeze thaw uh, and a lot of rain. And this basically failed right away. Um, the metal in this building was made by the Eiffel company that made the Eiffel Tower. Uh, so, and it was a, it's one of the few buildings that had metric in it. Um, Usually when I pull out a tape measure, everything's to inches, but it, it, was, a, it was a weird mix of, of inch and metric um, because the tube steel wasn't, wasn't something that you would get on the shelf uh, in America. Um, so then they demoed these glass blocks and basically gave me an architect's drawings and um, they wanted to put a concrete bullnose to replace the, uh, to match the, the cast uh, stone piers and uh, um, floor slabs that are exposed on this building. Um, so these, these are drawings. I did these drawings, I think in December. Um, I didn't know how to put drawings into this slide. So I took a screenshot of, uh, of, of, a, of my screen, um, brought this in because PDFs didn't come in. So it's kind of fuzzy, but uh, lots of notes. This is just part of a drawing. Um, and then, then I made, this is actually a job that I did a lot of physical work on, we made the wooden pattern. Um, we made one pattern and we made three molds. This is the mold that's about um, I think it's six feet long. Um, it's two feet in diameter. Uh, the pink ribs are used to strengthen the piece. Um, and then we cast the piece and, and you saw that they got uh, these 2000 pound pieces of concrete got bolted to the French steel uh, and are there right now. And hopefully they'll stay there for a long time and won't fall off. <laughs> So that's, that's the running through our, our uh, general job. Um, and now it's run through different processes. We do a lot of pattern work. Um, like on, on the left was how something weathered a hundred year old concrete came back. On the right is uh, plaster work. We have uh, several sculptors, several uh, different people. We have uh, one guy from uh, Russia who went to St. Petersburg Academy. Um, we have another guy that does a lot of sculpture for us that is untrained. Uh, I don't even think he has a high school uh, diploma um, and he's from Central America. Um, in the, on the right is an urn um, and 
we do a lot of uh, you know running profiles, and th this is uh, you know the, these pieces have to be uh, perfect. Um, we and we take a lot of photos because we have to have approval before we move. Um, a lot of these pieces are from a water fountain, which I'll show later. Uh, the largest uh, water feature when it was built in 1911 in the world, um, and, and still pretty has to be pretty tall on that list. Um, here, here we are. This is in uh, Lincoln Park in uh, Jersey City, um, which is on the other side of New York City. Um, we brought these uh, like one and a half lifetime of life-size pieces of these uh, pans uh, that were blowing uh, and their legs were completely gone. We added uh, seashells working with the architect, um, a leaf for modesty. Uh, we redid the horns. This uh, had been patched and repatched many times. So a lot of it was like figuring out what it re really was. Um, here, the, here are the castings. They have the copper and, and uh, plumbing built inside of them. Uh, all of the reinforcement in this is stainless steel. Hopefully they last longer than the originals. We're using Sika admixtures to, for strength. Um, here's a, this is a, this guy um, spills water, this king with a crown spills water out of his mouth. Uh, you can see the eagle on the top that we did. Um, we did the small column and we did the, the small bowl on top, the uh, other column and the other bowl, that's all done in place. Um, that they fixed up and coded. Uh, there it is in action. Uh, we made it on the schedule on time. <laughs> That's the original, uh, the original bowl, uh, the kind of the saucer in a in a ten yard uh, container, roll off container, throwing it away. Um, it, this is uh, one of our sculptors that used to work with us, uh, do, fixing up a bracket. Um, that's an old photo, maybe 10 years on the, on the right. Um, there's the pattern being done on the right is uh, some casts fitting together. Um, here I'm showing how um, a lot, some patterns work, just start from a drawing. The piece on the left was uh, completely gone. It looked like mashed potatoes and, and there were just fragments. And so we did a full size drawing of uh, what, it, what it would be. An architect and owner would approve it. On the, um, or I'm sorry, on the right, it was at the top. We have in the background, uh, I printed a large scale version of the only photo we could find that was in the New York Public Library of this element. Um, that's all we had to go on. And it was very pixelated. Uh, and we sculpted uh, at the bottom what's below. Um, that was for Hewitt School. Uh, sometimes I'm on scaffolding. Um, at the left is uh, 1185 Park. Um, it's one of the few buildings that all of the elevators are operated by human beings. So uh, you'll never be alone in the elevator. I'm sure the maintenance cost is incredibly expensive at that building. Uh, on the right-hand side, I'm. Um, putting together where we're, we're showing how we're recreating because they couldn't touch they had somebody had cut an air conditioner hole so we're fitting a fitting a piece into this pattern uh to kind of basically fill a hole and they're building it out of uh wooden plaster um sometimes we do a lot of neo grec buildings uh these were built probably about the time Oklahoma became a state, 1907, up to maybe stop building them around 1920. Um, this is a, a plaster pattern that um, the entire thing didn't even exist. So, but I was able to make a tracing of half of it. Then we assume the symmetry and we know the size we're building to. Um, and that's cut out of a solid piece of plaster. Plaster is much easier to carve than stone. Um, I was watching uh, the local, I think, ABC real estate show, and uh, there was, they were showing the new, uh, the new condos that they opened up in the Woolworth building. And uh, the, the real estate um, agent who's uh, giving this tour of, you know, these, this is like 
million dollar or, or you know numbers that are so expensive that you know you can't even wrap your head around it um apartment buildings and he walks out to the terrace and he touches um a casting and he's like you know the original detail is so special and it's like <laughs> that was, <laughs> was meant to look like the original detail it was never there we made it uh we made that like a year ago but this is the pattern we made uh for the Woolworth building um we do a, this is egg and dart uh, dental i'm going to try to go fast here on the right we're taking a photograph of the building of a of a rosette and on the left is uh like sculpting it in clay and wood um wooden profiles custom molding this is a clay pattern for the waldorf um, on the right, we took a tracing of that stone. On the left is, uh, is clay and plaster. Um, we did a gypsum mold out of that. So it was very fast. We turned that whole thing around in a week uh, because it was kind of a fast thing. Um, this is a pattern. It's, it's over 10 feet long. Um, it was really hard to take a single photograph. Um, this would, never existed, but it was... Uh, it was taking elements from the building, reducing them in size to, to be an entrance on a on a new penthouse. Um, that's also like multi million dollar real estate. Um, a lot of detail. This is a smaller brownstone restoration where where these uh, brackets were completely missing, and we were able to compile photographs and and did some castings on the neighbors. Um, to for a brownstone this is a very recent project they're still putting up the last pieces they got stopped by winter covid uh, really slowed this job down um plaster uh globe on the left um and on the right we're doing a clay sculpture on top of missing brownstone with plaster um an architect uh, uh a building wanted fish on their entrance um these are three dimensional. Uh, so the architect did a sketch for the fish that should be on top of the fish. And so we printed the sketch, the full size, and the, the part of the sculpture going on. This is a uh, mold work. This was, uh, these are the I'm gonna take series of photos of molds. And it looks like I'm going to go over time. Um, this mold is 12 feet in diameter. That, that was the part of the fountain. Um, we do a lot of rubber molds. Rubber molds you use when you can't unlock from a shape. Um, that's a bracket, uh, like part of a cornice. Um, here we're applying rubber to a face. This face is like three feet tall. Um, rubber is very expensive. Um, it's about $550 for a 10 gallon kit. So um, this mold below, we're only using rubber um, on the on the ornamental details, um, the, it's backed with uh, carpentry. Um, this is also like a neo uh brownstone building. Here I'm making a site mold of a, of a texture uh, for a piece um, that's missing, that, that got destroyed, uh, possibly even fell off the building. Uh, I'm four stories up. Um, this, Hopefully, um, these drawings will get approved. Uh, this is a project that was, that this was in December when I took that photo. Um, this is a kind of a fun concrete piece. Um, I made this mold for the big, for the A. Uh, it's a brewery that's right around the corner from work. Um, made the mold out of styrofoam using their logo and they had a stucco circle above their door. So now they have their, um, their sign. This is a church we're still working on. This church was built in 1919. It's a precast concrete church. The rebar in this church is iron. Um, this uh, pentafoil is uh, about 10 feet uh, in diameter. Here we're laying it up, uh, making sure the pieces fit, making sure we have everything. We're still, this, this is a job in progress. Um, this is half of a mold for a, like a, a crocket for a church. Um, here we're pulling that uh, piece from the water fountain out. We rented a 10 ton forklift and uh, it apparently wasn't enough. We had to stack a skid of concrete on the back so, because it was tipping up. This is a large mold. Uh, we did this with, a, with another artist. Um, this is a concrete bench and I kept 
telling him, I'm like, he's like, oh, I can make this mold to withstand the um, pressure. The minute we started vibrating it, the mold started to bend. We had to clamp, uh, we had to clamp beams onto this mold uh, so that it would come out straight. It's a large cornice mold. Uh, the table that they're on, it's a vibrating table. Um, the, I, so we'll hook a vibrator up to the table. It'll shake the table. Uh, the table's on springs. Uh, this is a recent um, thing we did. It's uh, concrete, two color concrete castings to match uh, like a weathered tavertine. Um, these are pieces, we do a lot of split face. Uh, so we'll take a, a sneak up to green concrete with a chisel uh, to leave a, like a chisel uh, finish. We can do this very fast. Um, Work. He said, this is a product we make GFRC, glass fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, a lot of, we do a lot of cornices. Uh, they'll have a steel armature. Um, here's uh, some castings, brownstone castings for a church. This is a, one of our re building we've worked on the entire time I've been there um, and we're finishing it up the Waldorf is now empty um, they've got renovating it um, and doing a lot of fix up um, it'll be a job that and and COVID really slowed that entire process down um, but that that'll be a job we're going to be involved in in the next year two years uh, was able to be in the oldest brick building in Manhattan. Um, and I didn't even know it. I looked up the address. I was like, this is a really old building. And then I <laughs> had its own Wikipedia page. Um, I took this photo of the wood. Um, this, this is just a photo. It's a lot of these new buildings in Manhattan. They're tall, they're skinny. This one is over the Steinway piano building. Um, but it was next to a building we were working on. Um, Kipps Bay, this is, a, this is a building we did, a concrete building. We did a lot of sill replacement on this. Uh, this is the architect I.M. Pei. Um, he designed lots of parts of downtown Oklahoma City, was the first uh, uh, Jeopardy. I was watching on Jeopardy, they asked a question about the Louvre and it was like, oh, it's from that question, you figure out he was the first architect who wasn't French to work on the Louvre. Uh, he did the modern wing of the National Gallery. Uh, this is the largest clock face. We did lots of numbers on this building uh, in Brooklyn, uh, one Hanson place. Uh, there's Falcons up there. Uh, I'm on a building looking at the Ansonia Hotel in the background. Uh, that's where Babe Ruth lived when he was... Uh, Famous, they had cows on the roof uh, for milk. Here I'm across from the MoMA Metro uh, Modern Museum of Art. Um, at the back of it, uh, you can see the sculpture garden uh, in the, at the very top of the photo, but there's this decorative roof that I had no idea that existed. Um, this is a, one of the church with the pentafoil. Um, this is the concrete, uh, original concrete done in 1919. Uh, I don't even know how they made the mold. My assumption is it was made out of gelatin or, or wax. Um, this is a project uh, that we did a, um, some different water tables on uh, 30 Morningside Drive, uh, the old Linux hospital. Uh, St. John Divine is in the background. I was, um, here's a, I, a series of photos uh, real quick. I know I'm over time. Um, but not all buildings are built right. There's lots of mistakes. Uh, these are garlands that were set upside down and I don't know when they were set, maybe several years ago. Uh, the ribbons are, are upside down, the flowers are upside down. A lot of times these mistakes happen um, on modern buildings because people don't understand how profiles 
go as a language kind of um you know i think i think people were more attuned to that 100 years ago uh here's one balusters upside down um would drive me crazy <laughs> the rent on this uh the rent on this building was the highest square foot retail uh something something crazy like over a hundred thousand dollars a month um here's another garland that's upside down uh they're putting signage uh just bust through uh decorative uh elements to put up a steel uh structure for signage um things i love about new york before COVID, this is my daughter we would go to galleries uh to, we're at here we're at two different um richard sarah shows she would get to run around and then COVID hit this is the roosevelt hotel um, which every time i've seen it before you would have a guy with white gloves and a gray shirt with gold buttons and a fancy hat would be out there with polishing the brass or picking up somebody's suitcase and they've just got black plywood uh stapled up everybody's wearing a mask this is the food court at grand central this was taken in February. The, at, this is at noon. Uh, if I would have tried to take a photo like this with as few of people, I would have to show up at like three in the morning uh, pre-COVID. Here's Grand Central. They, they're doing interior renovation. I just have to be there. Um, it's empty. It, but I, um, during COVID, we did have a lot of time to paint. Um, that's my daughter, Abigail. Um, that's it. Awesome, so that, Eric. that, that was my talk. I tried to keep it. I think I, I think I did it. Maybe I'm only did, five or 10 minutes great. late. <laughs> you, did, you, did great. Okay. you did great. Okay. Uh, we're going to just transition to the Q and a session. So we do have a few questions and one of the first questions is for, for Layla. Uh, and that is, how is art viewed or expressed in Saudi Arabia? Um, what's interesting is the contemporary art scene is not, well, it's contemporary, right? But um, it really started picking up in 2014. Before that, we had a lot of artists, just not a lot of attention. And um, I think a lot of the artists are the same artists as you see are all over the world. But maybe this slightly different is that they really a lot of them look at or are influenced by Saudi Arabia and I don't know if they do that because they think that's what people want to see and that's what's going to be popular and then another thing is kind of getting like trendy and I would hope that they change it is like art installations everyone wants to do an installation even if it's not their thing and I'm, I'm all about exploring and experimenting but if you're gonna do it, do it well. <laughs> um, and we have some that don't, and um, and they're really good at something else. Uh, but but I, I I think um, I think it's it's growing. There's a, a huge 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 interest in art. Um, the the kingdom is building a new museum for. A, a Saudi art. Um, there's so many different projects. There's going to be a new museum about um, black gold. Black gold is actually uh, oil. And um, I'm not like promote, promoting oil and things like that, but that's what really um, made the country flourish and it, it helped uh, it helped the country um, become modern. But this this uh, museum is going to like an artist that explore it and in, in using either oil as a material or as or, um, just different concepts. So it's interesting. It was it had started off as an exhibition now is turning into a whole museum. So there is a huge interest um, in art. Um, some artists have come a long way, some have yet have a long way to go, um, but it's nice to, to see the evolution and to see the art scene, grow, uh, scene growing in Saudi Arabia. Good. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. This one also is for you, Layla. How, okay. has your, how has your experience in the art world been as a woman? What type of issues have you experienced and how have you overcome? Um, I don't think I've had a lot of issues as a woman in the art world, but I 
I think what's interesting is because where I worked when I was at Ithra, it belonged to an oil company and it was very male dominated. Um, I, a lot of times I was the only female in a meeting room. Um, for some people, it could be intimidating, but I think I, I was used to it. And uh, I never I never felt anything from anyone. Um, and I'm the kind of person, if someone tells me no, and it's something I really want, I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> so I'm very, I may be stubborn, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't, I think it's not me being a female. I think a lot of people think I'm younger than what I actually am. And they think I'm new to the job when I've, I've actually been around for a few years. Um, so I think it's more age than it is being female. Okay, good, good. Uh, okay, another question for Layla. Uh, could you describe a typical day in your life, maybe specifically regarding the different positions you held at Ithra? Okay. Um, okay. So when we first started off, uh, when Ithra was still not was still in the being developed, um, honestly, it was wearing many many hats. So I would have to be a curator, but I would also have to be a secretary. I would have to be a, someone a translator because a lot of times, so in Saudi Arabia or in the exhibitions that we do, it's always um, dual languages. So we use English and Arabic. And we work with companies from all over the world. Um, sometimes they can't speak Arabic, and sometimes so it was um, doing that. Um, it had to. I had to be a diplomat, and I'm. Uh, and my face is very expressive when I do not like someone or when I don't agree with someone. It shows on my face, so I've had to learn how to work on that. I don't think I'm very good at it yet, but it's okay. Um, and then, uh, and so that was when I first started off and um, uh, I started out, but then um, when I started running the museum, I, I think what I, I sometimes say I would have to be a counselor or a psychologist because uh, my responsibility shifted from being someone that actually curated exhibitions into the creative process to more of someone who had to bring the team together to um, um, work on these projects and to have them um, and, and to, to get them ready. Um, so, and, and sometimes I'm like, I don't get paid enough for this. Like, I don't wanna hear your problems. I just want the work to get done. Um, but but if the morale of the team is not doing so good, you're not going to get what you need, right? Um, so it's just that balance of of being someone who's supportive, but also being the leader that you have to be to get the work done. Good, good. And awesome. then my current job. I'm sorry, am I going too long? No, no, you keep going. Um, okay, so my current job. Um, I'm really, really new to it, and I I was a little bit intimidated. And not knowing how everyone was gonna, like how they were gonna accept me. I'm the first female director of the National Museum. And um, at, a, at a time in Saudi Arabia, men and women were segregated when they worked. And this is still like, existing in the National Museum. Not every, like they do have a women's department, but also some offices, they have it mixed. And I'm here coming in to a place where they had the segregation. I'm going to be their boss. Um, I wasn't sure how to approach it. Like, I didn't know what was the best way. Were they going to accept me? Um, and so the way I, I, I did it is my, in my first two weeks while I was there, I met with every, we have 48 employees currently. It's not enough to run a museum, but um, I met with every single person. I had a 30 minute meeting, so a chance for me to get to know them because I don't know who they are either. Maybe they're not in the right place. You know, I need to see if they're if they're in the right department or if they need to move somewhere else. And I think that has helped me a lot. Um, it's gotten me buy in with the, with the different people. So I, I feel like it's um, it's uh, helping us bond better. But the way I would describe the National Museum is an established startup, because I have to work on everything, um, the team, but also the um, institution. Okay, good, good. That's that's good information right there. <laughs> is that, that bonding with your employees, especially in a new situation like that, coming in, I can definitely see where you, the intimidation could be there for sure. Yep. Uh, okay, good. Okay, I do have a question for Aaron. Uh, what is the process of securing heavy concrete feature to sides of walls so they don't fall off? <laughs> um, wow, that's a, that's a hard question to answer with words. Um, it'd be better to do with like a pencil and paper. Uh, stainless steel anchors, um, 
epoxy, uh, epoxy with into threaded rod. Uh, there's blind connections. Um, Homan and Bernard is a engineer, an engineering a company uh, that was started probably in 1970. Um, they, uh, if you Google Homan and Bernard stone anchors, uh, that, that their numbering system is the number that people use, even if they don't necessarily use that company's uh, anchor system. So like a H&B uh, number 433 um, might be an anchor that, that you, you would attach, but that's all done through a drawing process. Um, uh, and in, in almost all situations, an engineer would approve that. Um, calculations would follow. Um, engineers make really good money if uh people are very good at math <laughs> it's a, it's i mean an, an engineer can make can make in new york 350 dollars an hour and to show up to a job they can charge a thousand dollars um and that's if they take the subway they pocket that so um it's it's those people uh that that's a short answer I guess okay. for that question. How to attach a how to attach a stone? Gotcha. No, that's good. Uh, another technical question question is how do you spray concrete, or what's your process for spraying concrete? Um, we have we have a dump gun. Um, there's there's a company Spray Tech um, that uh, basically you know we'll have a mixed design so we'll um so like for the waldorf we're doing a lot of gfrc and it's meant to look like uh concrete the gfrc panel looks like 100 year old concrete so we have a whole uh we can't buy the aggregate the sand that we need so we have a sifting method a uh, series of screens it's somewhat labor intensive but it's actually not a lot of sand used in each piece uh, because that so you would spray a face coat um, and then uh, for all the gfrc there's a, a backup mix uh, that's either sprayed um, or applied in uh, and the that would mix design has uh, Forton, which is a latex um, it's also used in the dental industry um, and the glass, uh, if you're using uh, fiberglass in concrete, you have to make sure it's AR or alkaline resistant um, because the, if, you use, if you go to Home Depot and you buy fiberglass, um, that glass can break down in a very quick period of time. Um, there's one manufacturer there in Japan so uh, mm -hmm. that makes the, all the AR glass and that, that you see in the United States. Wow. Um, I mean, it's, unless I'm sure if there was a demand for it, Cornell or, you know, some, you know, could start manufacturing that. Cool. Awesome. Okay, good. Yep. Okay. I do have a question that I'm going to ask of both of you. Uh, so we'll start with Layla. Uh, what is the best advice you have for current students in terms of what to focus on as a student, current student? And then what is needed most in terms of preparing for life after graduation? I think um, if you really, really love something or you see yourself really, really good at something, go for it, even if you're not sure what you're going to do with it, um, because you'll find a way to make it work. And it's not necessarily always going to be easy and it's not always going to come fast. I have had jobs that I hated, but it will. And you don't know, we don't know what the future holds. Like there were no other museums in Saudi Arabia at the time that I was studying. I had no clue that I was going to be in a museum and and here I am. So we don't know what the future holds. So do what you love. And I know that's kind of cliche, but it it does work. You um, you will find a way to make it work. And what was the second part of the question? Sure. Uh, what is needed most in terms of preparing for life after graduation? Um, don't let it get you down. Um, it's, sometimes you're going to go through bad things, something things are going to happen, but just have a positive outlook. Um, and, and I say this because like, I, I've, I've had the opportunity of studying abroad, coming to the United States and studying there, and I've gotten to travel. And um, I lived in I live in a country where women used to not be able to drive. 
And in 2018, now we have the right to drive, you know, and, and I didn't honestly, I didn't think that I would be able to um, as an adult that maybe, you know, my nieces and nephews would, but I am, I have my own car. I, I, and I'm, you know, and so you just, you never know things change. Um, be open to it it's uh, and accept it be flexible um i was really really worried about leaving my job it's the my job at isra is a really great company um very established amazing benefits going to a job in a new city and i know no one there um but i don't regret it and i was like if i don't do it now when will i get this opportunity again so I think sometimes people ask you what your goals are for the next five years, 10 years. I don't put goals for myself because I feel like if you put goals for yourself, you limit yourself to opportunities that may come. Keep yourself open to everything and then you'll be able to choose what's best for you. Good, good, good answer. Erin, uh, would you like to tackle that as well? Um, yeah, yes to everything that Layla said. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I actually, no, you have to be interested if, if you're not interested in what you're doing, you're going to do a pretty sorry, you know, job at it. Um, work hard. I mean, like I, you know, grew up on a farm, uh, like, and so I'll, always, you know, I work until I'm tired and love it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, that'll hard work can get you a lot. Um, doesn't do everything, but, but it can get a lot. Um, so an advice, hmm. uh, I guess you have to just like, you have to lean on whatever, whatever advantages you have, you know, if you, if you have some advantage, lean into it, you know, um, otherwise, I guess you'll just be a cookie cutter or whatever, you know, lean into whatever advantage you can, because you kind of need those, it's the world, you know, you need everything you can get. 